I've been doing this thing for a while now and it still seems to me that the inhabitants of Flurfia don't really get some basic ideas. So let's take a different approach. Now it turns out that the galactic omelette fanciers still don't seem to grasp this whole atmosphere thing and they keep harping on about how a container is needed to maintain pressure. That we need a barrier between high pressure systems and low pressure systems to maintain that difference in pressure. And we start with a simple example where we have two identical tubes attached end to end, but they are separated by a valve. We'll have the tube one on the left and tube two on the right. Now, if we open the valve, the pressure will equalize, but what will the resultant pressure be? Well, we use the ideal gas law to describe all of this. The ideal gas law states that the product of pressure and volume is equal to the amount of substance multiplied by the ideal gas constant and the temperature T. Now for the first tube, before opening the valve, we have P1V1 being equal to N1RT1. And for the second tube, we have the same expression, but with twos in the subscript. But after we have opened the valve, the whole system becomes one tube, and we will call this tube 3, so that final system can be described with P3 V3 is equal to N3 times R times T3. But we will take all measurements after allowing everything to get to a thermal equilibrium, so T1 and T2 and T3 are all equal to just T. And we will say that V1 and V2 are equal volumes because they were identical tubes, so V3 is equal to 2 times V. It then follows that N3 is equal to the sum of N1 and N2. And it follows that our expression for the final state is then given by this, by 2 times P3 times volume being equal to the sum of N1 and N2 multiplied by the ideal gas constant and temperature. But we then expand out, so 2P3V is N1RT plus N2RT, and on the right hand side we see that N1RT and N2RT are equal to P1V and P2V respectively. So the Vs cancel out and we rearrange. So yes, that was a very long-winded way of saying that in this situation, the resultant pressure is just the average of the two. But fuck it, I need to get past this 10 minute mark. Okay, so now we take on some examples. Let's say that we have atmospheric pressure in tube one at 101,325 Pascal, or just 101 kilopascal, but that detail will become important in a bit. And we have a vacuum in tube two. Well, we don't really have a perfect vacuum, as such a thing does not exist, but let's just say that it is very small, something like 1.3 times 10 to the minus 15 pascal, and that is 10 to the minus 17 tor for you nincompoops out there. Seriously, stop the silly units, he says, fully aware that his vacuum chamber also measures the pressure in tor, but then again, that thing is 60 years old. Anyway, back to the point. Finding the resultant pressure after opening the valve is quite simple, and we plug the numbers in and we get a value of around 50.5 kilopascals. But now we do it for different initial conditions. Let's say that tube one has a pressure of 101,325 pascals and tube two has a pressure of 50,000 pascals. The resultant pressure is then 75,662 pascals. No problem there. But finally, we take tube one to have the same initial pressure, but tube two has a pressure of 101,312 pascals. So that is a difference of 13 pascal. What happens when we open the valve? Well, the pressure equalizes to 101,318.5 pascals. So we have clearly established that you cannot have a pressure difference between two regions without a barrier between the two. As soon as you remove the barrier, the pressure will equalize. So it seems like the space pizza aficionados are correct. But what happens if we measure the air pressure at sea level? Well, at an altitude of zero meters, we get 101,325 pascal. But when we measure it one meter above sea level, we get 101,312 pascal. Now, you'll see that these are the numbers used in that last example. But where is the barrier? Where is that pressure equalizing? This seems to be completely different than what we showed in the lab. 
And now if we repeat the measurement at the top of Mount Everest, we get 31,444 Pascal, and one meter above the top of Everest, we get 31,439 Pascals. Now that is only five Pascal difference compared to the 13 Pascal difference we saw at sea level. But if we go up to the Kármán line, we measure 0.71447 Pascal, and one meter above that we measure 0.71439 Pascal which is a difference of 80 micropascal. Now, all these values used would be slightly different if you were to really perform the experiment, and this is because of weather conditions. But we seem to be perfectly happy with this relatively large pressure difference at sea level not equalizing. So why would we expect the pressure to equalize at the top of Everest or at the Kármán line? Why would we expect the atmosphere to escape? But from our expedition to the top of Mount Everest to perform the measurements, we found something important, and that is that it's fucking hard work to get there. And it seems to be that you need quite a bit of energy to get something to increase in altitude. So perhaps this means that this increase in the required energy has something to do with it. Now, after some clever observations and experimentation, uh, we come to a simple equation that gives us the amount of energy required to get to some altitude, and we'll just use a simple approximation, and that won't trigger cosmic pancake fans, and we'll just say that this energy is 9.81 meters per second squared times the mass times the height. Now, it doesn't matter where this 9.81 meters per second squared comes from, it is just there. Just accept it. And we know from the conservation of mechanical energy that the maximum height an object with uh, some kinetic energy can reach is found using this expression. Now we can cancel the m's and rearrange for h to get this. Now through some more clever mathematics and experimentation, we also know that in a given volume of gas, the velocity of the particles follows the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And this gives the fraction of particles in a given volume with a particular speed. But hey, we can do something cool now. We can figure out how many of the molecules at sea level will have sufficient speed to reach some arbitrary height. Because we have the expression that h is equal to the velocity squared divided by 19.62, which we can rearrange for v squared, and we can plug that into the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And let's see how many particles at sea level actually have sufficient energy to reach the Kármán line, assuming that the particles do not collide with another particle on the way. To do that, we will make the y-axis log scaled so we can see, and we integrate with respect to h between h is 100,000 meters and infinity. Okay, so about 0.0. 0.03% of the gas particles at sea level have sufficient energy to reach the Kármán line or beyond, under the provision that those particles do not collide with any other particles on the way there. So only a tiny amount of the atmosphere at sea level actually has sufficient energy to escape to outer space. And remember that once that particle has reached its maximum height, unless it gets trapped in a different potential well, it will just fall back down again. Now finally, we touch on the problem of a barrier, and you might have caught on where this is going. What is a barrier? Well, to us, a barrier is a solid object through which nothing can pass. It is completely filled and there is no empty space. Well, if you were the size of an atom, then you would see that actually it is all just empty space. But every time you come close to this barrier, you notice that there's some weird force pushing you back. However hard you try, you just cannot get through this region. So why is it that an atom, which is mostly empty space, can't enter this region where there are lots of other atoms, which are also mostly empty space? Now, there is a lovely bit of physics here which describes that, but let's just say that there is a repulsive force between the atoms, and when there is a force, moving against that force increases the potential energy. Now, when the gas particle approaches the barrier, its potential energy spikes up and all its kinetic energy is converted. When no kinetic energy is left, the potential energy is converted back to kinetic energy, and the particle shoots off in the opposite direction. Now, this potential energy barrier is huge and explains why objects appear to be solid to us. It is actually due to these interatomic forces and not because of one solid thing physically touching another. At the atomic level, that idea actually becomes meaningless. 
every time you press on something with your thumb, then you will feel this force acting in the opposite direction. And this is because you are moving the atoms on the surface of your thumb to up this potential energy gradient. And as we increase our altitude, potential energy also gets higher. After all, it is hard to climb up, but it is pretty easy to fall down. But the difference between the potential due to the barrier and the potential due to our increasing height is that the change is sharp for the barrier and it's smooth for increasing height. So where are we at? Well, the proponents of the stellar tortilla will make a claim along the lines of it is not possible to have two regions with different pressures without a barrier between the two. Therefore, it is not possible to have an atmosphere next to the vacuum of space. And through this video, we have actually covered several issues around this statement. The first is that there is no such thing as a perfect vacuum. Now, I stress this point because I have come across many members of the aforementioned fan clubs who seem to think that a vacuum is something other than a low pressure system. Now, the pressure difference between sea level and one meter above sea level is orders of magnitude larger than the difference between the Kármán line and one meter above the Kármán line. If we do not see the pressure equalizing at sea level, then why would we expect it to happen up there, where that pressure difference is so much smaller? It seems to be perfectly feasible to have a pressure difference between two regions, provided that there is a potential energy difference. Now, potential energy increases with height, and we observe a decrease in pressure with height. And the Maxwell-Boltzmann equation actually shows us how high particles in the atmosphere can go. But here is the kicker. It also shows something else. And that is that, in fact, we do actually lose atmosphere to outer space. And it happens all the time. But it is just a tiny amount. And it gets better because as long as you recognize that potential energy actually increases with height, then it doesn't matter if the Earth is a sphere or a giant flatbread. There is no need for a dome to contain the atmosphere. Now, of course, it would still be useful because NASA still needs something from which to hang those fairy lights.